Um, so I really happy uh, that we have uh, Emily Real here to talk to us today. Uh, she's a professor at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, she is a category theorist and not a computer scientist, well, a homotopy theorist, a mathematician generally. Uh, she's, uh, people often say, well, as a programmer, what book should I read about to learn category theory? And the answer is usually, I learned it from the second one I read. Um, <laughs> so um, her book that's out, Category Theory in Context, could be your second book. Um, I think it would be a good candidate for that. Um, and uh, uh, she's, I, I, I think, uh, I don't know what level her talk's going to be at here, but I will say that she is, really stands out as an educator, and it's not just this book that she's produced or so on, but I actually returned repeatedly to her uh, notes on factorization systems or uh, uh, weighted co-limits or various things that she's made a point in her career of having freely accessible resources to really open up a lot of stuff, and I'm hoping that's what her... Uh, talk here will do today to sort of set a high-level stage for what's going to be both a high-level and really practical conference. So uh, thank you everyone for being here and let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Gershom. Um, I uh, really appreciate this opportunity um, and I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, I guess I should uh, begin by acknowledging that I don't have very much programming experience. I think the last uh, code I wrote was about a decade ago and it was in Magma. And before that, the only thing I can remember was programming my TI-82 to do a like side angle side, angle side angle trigonometry query, which I, I take it is not what functional programming is about. So um, anyway, what, what I'm looking forward to, to, or what was fun for me in preparing this talk was to try and learn how to speak your language or languages uh, a little tiny bit, and I probably have not succeeded in um, saying things in the way that will be most familiar to you. So um, if you want to interrupt at any point and uh, point out uh, some terminological infelicities or, or some alternate terminology, please do, or if you just want to ask a question. I'm hoping that this talk is pretty, pretty light uh, on the mathematics. So it is a mathematical talk, because I figured I should say something that I know for sure is true, that uh, is re reassuring. So, um, great. I'm trying to think whether there was, oh, and I also wanted to thank, uh, so this, the slides are available on the internet if you're interested. Um, I should have written a link down somewhere, but uh, here's how you find it. You Google me, uh, you find my academic homepage, and then it's compose.pdf after that. That's where they are. Um, I'll make that more obvious uh, afterwards. So. I guess let's just go ahead and begin. Um, so the inspiration for this talk is a paper that I read um, a few months ago as part of a sort of online graduate seminar in category theory um, by Martin Highland and John Powder. It's essentially the same title as this. It's listed in the references at the end. Um, and they're imagining an alternate future. Um, so both of these uh, category theorists knew Eugenio Mogi when he was uh, writing his uh, just post-thesis work on uh, monads for computational effects, and they um, were wondering what would have happened had either of them suggested looking at Levere theories at that time, because uh, the Levere theories were already in existence, and they sort of speculate that uh, the conception of the use of monads in, uh, to model programming languages would be slightly different, and I thought that this was a neat idea that might interest you. Um, it's uh, certainly not original to me, and it's been known for some time in the computer science literature as well, but anyway, this is just an expository talk. So, um, how do I do this? Okay, so the broad overline, I'm, uh, I'm not assuming any acquaintance with category theory, so I'll start by um, describing just how mathematicians think about functions and composition and uh, motivate the definition of a category from that point of view. Um, then uh, I want to explain maybe not so much what a monad is, but what a monad does. And uh, the slogan will be, it turns programs for some particular sort of computational effect into categories. Uh, then I'll uh, explain what a Levere theory is, sort of, or really how this, this category that you're thinking about from the monadic perspective is essentially just a Levere theory. So there is, uh, there's a more complicated definition of a Levere theory, but it's really just this category that you were looking at already, uh, and then I'll say something more technical at the end about the comparison between Levere theories versus monads. Um, and if you want to really get technical, I'm going to be around all day, so just uh, we can chat afterwards. Uh, so here's the main takeaway. This is what this is, if you uh, learn or remember one thing 
from this talk. So if we have um, some particular notion of computation in mind, so uh, sort of lists, exceptions, that sort of thing. Um, so when I say a T program, I'm, I'm following uh, Mogi's terminology largely just because I didn't have better names for these things. So um, I'm following some historical terminology. So by a program, what I mean is a function whose inputs are some sort of set of values of type A and whose outputs are uh, sets of computations of type B, so maybe lists of type B, something like this. Uh, so what a monad is, to, to say T is a monad means it has some additional structures that allow us to turn these programs into the arrows in a category. So that's really the point of having a monad from this point of view. Uh, and uh, if you look at this category and sort of restrict to the cases where A and B are finite types, uh, then that's essentially just the Levere theory. So the Levere theory is visible inside this category whose arrows are programs. And uh, if you forgot about the monad stuff and just started with this category that you end up th with, so these programs between finite types, uh, then the Levere theory um, presents sort of operations and equations for the computational effect. So it's an alternate universal algebraic perspective of the computational effect. And this asterisk is I promise that if I'm ever lying to you slightly, I'll indicate it. Uh, so there's some fine print. Uh, so in most cases, you'll return the original monad that you started with, but there's some technical size condition, and I'll explain more about that later on. A uh, finite number of elements, yeah, yeah, that's, yes, thank you. Just a finite number of elements. And, and maybe more technically, you know, pick one uh, representing the uh, cardinal one, one representing the cardinal two, and we're just restricting between those things. Cool, okay. Um, so, I mean, one thing that's a bit confusing is that the way a, a mathematician thinks about a function and the way you learned about functions at the high school level are like, kind of totally different. So, uh, if you see some, a formula like this that looks like a function, um, and uh, maybe a, a um, development in 20th century mathematics is the right way to think about a function is it always has a specified set of possible input values and potential output values. So it always comes typed, I guess. Is, um, so uh, some visual notation for that, if I is the set of inputs and O is the set of outputs, um, we draw, represent the function as an arrow like this. And I'll say source for the inputs and target for the outputs, just using this arrow uh, intuition. Um, so what's the point of all that? Uh, well, so if we keep track, if we enumerate precisely what the inputs are um, and what the outputs might be, um, then it's sort of easy to visually identify when functions are composable. So if f is defined on a, and the outputs are among the values in B, and G is defined on all of B, then whatever the output of F is, you can input that into G and you'll get something in C. So the, uh, this helps us enumerate composition. Okay, so I mean, this might seem kind of silly, but let's, let's think about an example. So here's some functions F and G, and are they composable? Uh, well, it, it depends on uh, what I had thought of as the inputs and what I had thought about as the outputs. Really, it mean, what I mean is it depends on sort of what are the interpretations of these symbols. So uh, f we could think of as a function from the natural numbers, that's the positive integers, to the integers. Um, and z, or non-negative, I guess is how I, I do that. Uh, uh, g we could think of as a function from integers to rational numbers, to fractions, and then yes, evidently they're composite. You can just sort of write down the formula. You can input a natural number and you'll get fraction, that, that seems pretty good. Um, but I could interpret uh, this times, or this squaring x times x and x minus x as an operation on two by two matrices with integer coefficients, um, in which case I don't know what one half to the matrix is. And so um, it is sort of important to specify these inputs and outputs. Cool, okay. Right, so what is a category? Uh, so, I mean, a category is some sort of structure that I, I might say expresses the algebra of composition. So, um, so if from the point of view that functions are, or things like functions are important and uh, composition of functions are important, this is some sort of uh, framework with it which to, uh, I guess, encode the properties of composition that are important mathematically. So, 
Uh, a category has two sorts of things. It has objects, which I'll write as capital letters A, B, C, and it has arrows, um, which I'll write in this way, so each with a specified source and target among the objects, and then um, two additional structures. So firstly, for any pair of composable arrows, and we identify when arrows are composable because the source of one is the target of the other, uh, there needs to be a specified composite arrow, and the traditional notation for that is to use the compose symbol, which I guess you're familiar with, and, 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 and write in the order, so if, if F takes an argument that's written to the right, um, F goes first and then G. Okay, so there exists a composite arrow, and uh, moreover, each object uh, has an identity arrow, um, which whose source and target should be that object itself. And then this, these have to, this composition operation must be associative and unit. All if you don't know what that means, it doesn't really matter for right now. So, okay. Um, category is kind of a weird concept because it, um, I mean like the objects and the arrows don't have to mean anything. So sort of the, I'll, I'll mention some examples of categories in just a second, but um, you know, it's really some sort of abstract structure for studying this algebra of composition. Um, uh, you know, one way in which, I mean, categories are sometimes used to mat, mod, model, or to, sorry, to speak about complicated mathematical objects. So A could be uh, a ring, if you know what a, a ring is. Um, or, I mean, A could be nothing at all. These, these could just be sort of symbols that you're um, sort of manipulating in some algebraic way. There's this, uh, the, Proofs in that style are called diagram chasing. You're just sort of, you know, writing a bunch of equations of composites of arrows and saying this equals that equals that equals that. So, um, so uh, the reason I'm saying this is uh, if you're wondering what A and B really are and what F really is, um, just don't. <laughs> it doesn't have to. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's better to well, yeah. It doesn't it doesn't matter for anything that I'm going to say. Um, and I mean, so what category theory does in mathematics, this is a bit of an aside, is it uh, sort of studies properties of objects and arrows that don't depend on what they are, which is like kind of a weird um, perspective to take, but it's, it's sort of very, very bird's eye. Okay, so, sorry, I mean, the com composition, I, I, I'm assuming I don't have to motivate composition of functions to you, but I'm, maybe we'll motivate identities, like why, why do we ask for those in a category? Um, well, and one thing they're good for is it allows us to define the notion of isomorphism between objects. So we say that two objects are isomorphic uh, just when there's an arrow from one to the other and an arrow pointing back so that the specified composites uh, are identities. It's just the definition. And what's the point of that? Um, well, sort of in general, anything you can say categorically about A is necessarily always true about B if A and B are isomorphic. So this isomorphism is some sort of mathematical structure that witnesses that A and B are really the same. Um, any functor will preserve the isomorphism. So, um, you know, so A and B can be used interchangeably in some sense. Sort of information about A can be transferred to B along this isomorphism. So I mean, that's a that's kind of a cool thing. Um, and this is a very simple definition, but prior to category theory, people had to define what an isomorphism was for any sort of mathematical object that they studied. And um, th this definition works in any category. It's always the right notion. It gives homeomorphism of topological spaces. Uh, I could use other words you don't know. Oh, maybe you won't, but um, yeah, so, okay. So that's the that's motivation for that. So if you do wanna think about what the objects and arrows in some category are, uh, let's, I'll, I'll tell you at least two. Um, so the first is uh, the category of sets and uh, objects. I guess I'd like to pretend that sets are finite today for the most part, just because it'll allow me to say some other things with fewer adjectives. Um, but this isn't an important restriction in any way. Um, there is an instance where the cardinality of a set matters, and I'll, I'll say a lot about that when that happens, but um, let me assume that sets are finite, but don't worry if you have some sets in mind that aren't finite, This everything I'm saying will apply to those equally. Uh, so the size, the number of, um, uh, right. Yeah, I mean one thing, like, I, one thing that's kind of fun that I guess I didn't know in, in high school is, um, you know, we, we sort of know what counting numbers mean up to where you get to infinity, and then when you're, um, going on past infinity. It depends on whether you're interested in ordering things or enumerating sizes. Count, um, 
yeah, so ordering versus size. Uh, and uh, the sort of ordinals are much more refined somehow than the cardinals, which me measure sizes. Yeah. Anyway, a bit of an aside that's probably irrelevant <laughs> to most programming purposes, but uh, a lot of fun. Okay, so, um, so let's assume that we're talking about finite sets just to make my life a little bit easier later on. Um, and uh, the arrows in this case are functions. So this is exactly the notation that I used for functions later on. This is maybe the prototypical example. Um, another sort of example that maybe you've encountered is uh, the syntactic category for some programming language. Uh, and I should thank somebody on Twitter uh, corrected my spelling of programming, which should <laughs> indicate that this is not a word that I use a ton. <laughs> so apologies for that. Uh, so objects here are types. Um, if you want to think of sets as types, that's, that works very well for me today. Um, and arrows are some sort of programs. Um, and you'll note that I've just described the objects and arrows in exactly the same way in both of these categories. So really, sort of what the objects are and what the arrows are isn't that important. That's not what you should be focusing on. Any questions so far? How are we doing? Sort of okay? All right. I'll stop and ask again later on, and then I won't continue until you ask a question. So, but this time we'll let you off the hook. <laughs> so, okay, so that's, that's the end of the first part. So just a little bit about composition and what a category is. So a category describes composition. Okay, so now I wanna say something about monads. Um, and before doing so, let me mention some examples in case I sort of inadvertently use some unfamiliar words. So, uh, so I mean, a monad is technically a functor, but it, I don't want to say functor. We don't really need the notion of functor today. So let's, let's think about sort of large functions whose inputs could be any set and whose outputs will then be another set. So an example of a function like this that takes one set or type or data type and returns another set or data type is the list function. Um, uh, that takes a set X and returns the set whose elements are finite lists of elements in X, finite ordered lists. Yes? You can do this, but I, here I don't know what you mean by a large function. Oh, uh, um, so if, if we ignored th that thing that I said previously that I want sets to be finite, um, or I guess even if we don't, um, there are, there's more than a set's worth of sets, uh, <laughs> as it turns out. Um, so if uh, the inputs to a function should be a set, uh, set itself is too big for that. And that's what I mean by the adjective large. This is not important. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you know, it's fascinating, but it's, uh, um, yes. So uh, it's just a function, but it's, it's kind of a function of a different order. Uh, we're, we, so we've, we've secretly just gone up category level one is, is one way to say that. So the inputs now are sets of any type as opposed to elements of some specified set. But, uh, yeah, I mean, so as a mathematician, um, if, if I'm having some sort of conversation and I don't know what category I'm in, I'm really, really, really uncomfortable. But my impression is that's less of an issue for you guys. So, so maybe just I don't <laughs> worry about that. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that's why I f personally find uh, computer science papers hard to read because it doesn't sort of clearly state we're working in the category of so, you know something. Or when it is, it's like WCPO, which I don't really know what that is anyway. So, okay, um, right. So, so sorry. <laughs> I'm, th these are some sort of notions of computation or some sort of computational effect. So, if you have a set X, uh, you could form the set whose elements are finite lists of elements in X. Okay, um, another notion of computation. Uh, this is sort of partially defined uh, functions or functions with errors. Um, so if I have a set X, I can form the set which contains all of the elements of X plus one new element that I definitely want to be different from the elements that were in X already, and I'm going to call it false, because this is sort of returning an error. Um, there's a function uh, side effects. Uh, this could also be state. Uh, so it's defined relative to some fixed set S. So S should be, uh, you know, a, a, some sort of set of states. Um, 
And for any input set x, we're going to return the set of functions from s to the product s times x. Uh, there's this thing called continuations, which is also defined relative to a fixed set R. These should be thought of maybe as return values. And uh, given another set X, um, we're going to form the new set whose elements are functions from X to R to R. So it's the set of functions of functions to R. Okay. And uh, there's this thing non-debt. Uh, for, uh, that takes a set x to the set of non-empty subsets of x. I think you'd say something slightly different if x were not finite, but maybe non-empty finite subsets. And uh, one more probability distribution, which I wanted to mention because it's going to come up again later today. Um, so here, uh, it's a easier to say what this is if x is finite. Um, so let's assume that for now. Uh, so a probability function on a finite set is then just a function into the unit interval from 0, 1. So all real numbers from 0 to 1. So the idea is it's taking an element to the prob probability of that element occurring among the collection of possible events. And um, you know, one thing happens, well, the, the sum of these probabilities should be 1. So something happens for sure, we just don't know what thing. OK, so think of. Uh, everything I'm going to say in this talk will apply equally to all of these examples, plus some others that I'll mention later on. Uh, one of the themes is that continuations behaves a bit differently, um, but that won't happen until the very end. So, uh, so whenever I write T, I want to invite you to think about uh, any of these large functions or any of these notions of uh, any of these notions of computation. Okay. So let me just keep all that here for a second, so just so we can think about all of these things. So this is the first important definition. Um, and it is of a, what I'm going to call a program. This is Mogi's uh, terminology, so I apologize if um, you don't like it, <laughs> in which case you should tell me afterwards. Um, so, uh, so a T program from A to B. So A and B are sets or types or something. Uh, by that, I just mean a function from A to t of b. So it's a function from the set of values of type a to the set of computations of type b. So it's in the case uh, t is list, it converts an element of a to a list of elements of b, and so on and so forth. Uh, in the case of non-debt, this is a t program converts an element of a to a subset of elements of B. So this is for some sort of non-deterministic computation where the outputs are in some subset but not uniquely determined. This only makes sense for right? Uh, yes, so T, right, so T should, right, so I should say as a caveat, um, I'm focusing on the category of sets here just to simplify things a bit, but it doesn't actually matter. Um, more generally, T should be an endofunctor of some category, and it can be any category you want. So if you don't like sets, that's not an, not an issue. It's just an expository issue. So. Okay. All right, so I'm going to introduce some notation for this. Um, so uh, a T program, again, what it actually is, is a function from A to T of B. Um, but I want to think of it as some sort of different kind of arrow from A to B itself. Um, I mean, it's, it's not, as a function, it's a function from A to T of B, but I want to think of that as being some sort of arrow in some category uh, from A to B. And so I'm going to use this squiggly arrow to signify that. So when I write a squiggly arrow with a name on it or without a name on it, what I mean, we've got some, some notion of computation T in the background. And what I mean by that is, again, a function from A to T of B. I've written the same F in both places because I, I mean to represent exactly the same thing with both symbols. Um, but uh, it will be convenient to think of this as some sort of arrow moving from A to B. Okay. Any questions so far? How are we doing? Um, some, will somebody translate that question for me? <laughs> yes. Right, and the elements of that would be a, a value? Is that what you mean? Yes. Yes. I think, th I think that's yes. Um, so. Yeah. 
F So let's, let's let A be the set of natural numbers, um, for instance, and uh, let's let B be the set of real numbers. So the uh, function, and let's have T be list, for instance. The sort of functions I'm talking about, what I'm calling T programs, would convert an actual natural number, 10, into a finite list of real numbers, um, which I don't have an example in mind. Yes? <laughs> Yes, any, so T would, T is, should be um, some notion of computation, so lists or uh, the partial or side effects or sort of interactive input output or exceptions. So it, um, it's one of these operations that converts a, so. Yeah, that's right. And so I've, you'll notice I've noticed, uh, used a different sort of typeface for the T and the A and B. Those are, those are totally different. So T, I guess, as you've pointed out, is from type to type, so it converts or from set to set, it converts a set, say, of elements to a set of probability distributions on that set of elements, something like this. Um, but, and that's kind, of, that's kind of at this meta level, whereas A and B are themselves sets who have values inside them, and then the, a function will act, act on the values. Yeah? So far, this has nothing to do with the computer program, right? <laughs> <laughs> So I guess what, maybe the way I should say this is I'm viewing this as a collaborative talk, so I'm going to try and say something <laughs> mathematical, and then I'll invite you to figure out what this has to do with computer programming. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> good strategy, right. Yeah, I'll stick within my realm of expertise. So, All right. <laughs> so, um, I want to suggest now that uh, Programs should form a category. Programs should be composable. A category, remember, is just some sort of device for composing things. It would be nice if programs could be composable. That's reasonable. So programs should form a category. Uh, so, so T, again, should be some sort of fixed thing from type to type. So um, I, I guess I'll keep referring to lists in absence of another choice, but it doesn't matter for anything I'm going to say. Uh, so again, this was the definition of a T program. So it's a function from some set of input values to some set of output values, but the output values might be more complicated. They're not just terms in B, they're lists of terms in B or subsets of terms in B, something like this. And I'd like these to form a category. I'll, I'll call this the categorical imperative. Uh, so, um, and programs should form a category. Programs should be composable. Okay, and this, this uh, uh, I think, really motivates the, the notion of monad, or at least as it's used in computer science. Um, and I, sorry, I guess I should say, uh, let's come back, ignore the statement of the theorem for a second. Let's come back to this uh, graphical representation of a program of a, with this squiggly arrow thing. I mean, if I'm composing programs relative to this notion of computation T, the inputs are really the set A, and the outputs are the set B, even though they come in some weird form as maybe subsets of elements of B or lists of elements of B or something like that. So in terms of, um, I'll, I'll focus a lot more on this in the next slide, um, a program is really some sort of arrow from A to B, even though what it really is is a function from A to T of B. So I'm trying to turn data like that into the arrows of a category. And a theorem that I'll state for you, which is uh, due to mains, is that a notion of computation defines a monad, sort of if and only if programs defined relative to it define the arrows in a category. Okay. So there's an asterisk here again, which I, I'm going to state when I'm lying very slightly. Uh, morally, this is correct. So the only if statement is there's no objection there. If I have a monad, then I get a category. Uh, and I mean, to get a 
monad back from the category, I need to define the category in sort of a particular way. So I'm using a Claisley triple to define the category, if you know what that is. Um, but so I'm going to all define the category on the next slide if you have a category defined in this way that does give you a monad. So morally, this is true. A monad is what is needed to, it's additional structure on T that is needed to turn programs into the arrows of some category to be able to compose programs. A monad is what allows you to compose programs. Okay, so let's think about this problem. So to define the category of programs, the category whose arrows are programs, uh, so we need first the identity arrows. So the arrows are going to be these, in this particular category of programs, are going to be these squiggly things. Um, okay, so to define it, identity arrows, remember whenever I draw one of these squiggly arrows, what I really mean is a function from A to T of whatever the target had been. So I need a function from A to T of A. Yes? Um, so could somebody translate that question? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so actually I should write, so in a category, it doesn't ever, um, uh, arrows in a category don't have to mean anything at all. So, um, so uh, <laughs> from the perspective of the category, what I need for each object, for each A, is, um, uh, sort of some arrow from A to A that when I compose with other arrows, it right. doesn't so do anything. Yes, that's but right. When you introduce T, you're saying I'm starting with an A, I'm introducing a T, mm -hmm. and now this other thing is a, is, is a, is a whole, it's, it's different than where I began, but I'm doing that also, also with regard to identity, which usually just gives you back the same thing. Right, okay. Um, I, I do think I understand uh, your question. So, um, so A, let's, let's, let me pretend A is a set. Uh, uh, so T of A is also a set. It's a very, right. it's probably a much bigger set. It's a different set. It's right. a more complicated set, but it is still a set. So it makes sense to think and about functions right. from. So then once you've done that, you just back to the set. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Um, so it is kind of weird. I'm suggesting in the category of programs that the the arrow that plays the role of the identity is some function that is not literally the identity function because it it's it goes from A to T of A. Okay. Um, it's, it's it, yeah, it's sort of a more complicated form of I identity, and, and you're right, it's, it's a really, so I'm defining the Claisley category, by the way, if you've, if you've heard of the Claisley category, it's a really weird thing that I, I guess I hadn't uh, puzzled about for a while. But it's weird for, it, I mean, it's really weird though that it's not itself an identity function. So the identities in the Claisley category and the category of programs that I'm defining are functions that are not themselves identity functions. They're more complicated. It's weird. Uh, great question. Thank you for, thank you for making us go there. Yes. Yes. I, I was, I, I looked that up. I was going to mention that. Yeah, this is return. <laughs> so <laughs> any other, um, Yes. Please. Um, I think you might have to think of, for example, for the previous um, definition of um, A and T of, T of B as A being the numbers greater than 2 and T is a factorization to prime numbers and B is the set of prime numbers. And then you have a list. Just to give an example of the previous case, I think that would make it more concrete. For this one, you, you define category of sets, so category of T programs, like A is a T program in this case, or I'm just trying to map this name of category of something. Yes, so A, uh, the pro right, so I'm naming the category after the arrows as opposed to after the objects, um, which is contrary to the usual convention, but maybe more in the spirit of category theory. So so A, A and B are still sets or, or types if you prefer to think of them like that. Um, but the arrows, uh, from in general, from an A to a T of B, I want to call that a program, and this is a category whose arrows are programs. 
that's what I'm trying to define for you, is a, a category whose arrows are programs, so I need to tell you about identity programs relative to T and uh, composition of programs relative to T. Yes? That's a great observation. Thank you for sharing that. So, anything else? So, yeah. What are the objects of this uh, whatever you objects you started with. So probably sets. So more generally, uh, a monad is something that can be defined on any category C. Um, we start with a function from the objects of that category to the objects of that category, and then the category of programs will have those same objects that we started with. The maps are completely different. But the maps are completely different. Yeah. This is this is a weird. And the identity is not the identity. It's like really bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to avoid using that word, though. I'll, I'll, I, it's going to sneak in sort of later on. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm confused about one thing. So I understand the example you gave, um, where T is the actual computation that's converting your value from A to B. What is F doing? What is F? Um, the F, yeah. So why don't I uh, why don't I take the example that was suggested? So uh, let's have A and B both be uh, sets of natural numbers, and let's have T be uh, this list, finite list of natural numbers. So uh, you guys are the programmers, not me. So I'll in invite you to tell me what F is. But uh, but an example of an F. Uh, might be some program that as input takes a very large natural number and as output produces, a, say, an ordered list of its prime factors. So that's some function from uh, the inputs are type n, so a, a natural number. The outputs are type lists of type n, so finite lists of prime factors, for instance. So n, but any f can be anything at all. I don't so actually care. If I could make that a little more concrete than f. If T of B, T here is a list, mm -hmm. F defined what the list should be, whether it should be prime factors or some other. Yes, absolutely, yes. F, F is the, the content of the program. So it, uh, it can be any, any function specified by any algorithm that you are interested in. Yes. Great. Yes. I don't know what those terms mean. Uh, so why don't, why don't you ask me later? That would be, um, I, so I'm going to say some special things about continuations at the very end, um, which may or may not address that. But yes. <laughs> Uh, yes, sure, sure. I'm, ha I'm happy, if it type checks, I'm happy to admit it. So, yeah, yeah, um, okay, great. So, uh, so I'm trying to argue for you that the programs, uh, so it, if I have sets or types as the objects that I'm interested in, uh, I'm trying to des describe a category whose arrows are programs. And what's weird about it is, again, uh, in a category, I need an arrow from A to A for any A. But what the arrows really are here are functions from A to T of A. So somehow I need to find a function from A to T of A that it's called the identity. That's weird. Um, but the monad, a monad has one. So uh, it's a good start. It's this thing return. Um, I guess I should maybe say what it is in an example. So if T is list, again, it sends every element of A. It's called X to the list that is just one list of length one, which is that element x. So it does kind of feel like an identity function, even though it's, it doesn't type check like an identity, because the input is a and the output is t of a. Really strange. OK, the other thing I need is some sort of composition rule. So in a category, whenever I have an arrow from a to b and an arrow from b to c, I need to produce for you an arrow from a to c. OK, but again, what? 
this arrow is, is it's a T program, so it's a function from A to T of B. And what the second arrow is, is it's also a function from B to T of C. And as functions, these aren't composable. Remember, for a mathematician, a function is composable with another function if and only if the uh, target here is the same as the source there, and that's not true. B and T of B are different things. Um, okay, so, uh, but a monad has some device that allows us to fix that. Um, so the other structure that's present in a monad is um, some operation that allows us to lift any function from B to T of C to some function from T of B to T of C. This is some sort of extension of the original function. And how these are defined will vary with the monad. So maybe an exercise for after this talk is to think about how the, these unit functions, uh, this is bind, by the way. Is that right? Did I say that right? Yeah, bind. Um, so how these uh, unit functions and how this sort of extension operation are defined in any particular example of interest. But um, in a monad, this is possible. And once I've done so, I'll finish my sentence and then come back. Uh, so f and g are not themselves composable as functions, but f is composable with this extended function g. And um, the composite is then the thing that will be a, it is a t program that represents the composite in the category. And now I've introduced some notation. So this is that's called the Claisley composition uh, operation. The category is, was discovered by a mathematician Claisley, and so we'll call this the Claisley category. It all depends on the notion of computation T, the computational effect you're trying to model in the background. Yes? Is there That's right. Uh, so certainly I, I want to think of list and non-debt as two different functors. Um, I have no idea what you're referring to, and that sounds really interesting, so we should talk about that later. Yes? <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, I don't, I don't know in practice, so maybe the question, I'll, I'll use slightly more categorical language just for those of you uh, who do speak it. Um, so an endofunctor T might admit the structure of a monad in different ways. I guess I don't know of any examples like that, though, and if you guys have them, I'd be, I'd be happy to know more about that. Um, so technically what a monad is, is it's this um, operation on objects um, together with the data of this unit and together with the data of extending functions to functions, and then there are some axioms, which I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you anything more about monads. I guess I'm more interested in what monads do in this context than what precisely they are. Um, but there are references at the end that do have precise definitions, yes. Yeah, uh, so let me, the next two slides are examples, and let me do it in that context, yeah. Uh, that would be an example of that. Thank you. So, yeah, great. So, um, I didn't know the name Ryder, but cool. Okay. So, uh, so the natural numbers, for instance, is uh, monoid and is that two multiple? Well, okay. Well, anyway, um, so here, let's do an example of these category of computations for one of these fixed notions of computation. So, I'm going to stick with partial. So partial, again, is the operation on sets that uh, takes a set and adds a distinguished element which we'll read as false or something. Okay, so a program relative to partial is just a, so again, we always write programs like this with a squiggly arrow, but what it is is it's a function from A to this new set, B plus false, 
And I'm going to call that a partial function from A to B. Um, because, uh, so I, I didn't emphasize this, though maybe I should have done. Uh, usually a function is something that for every input has to have an output. Um, we don't necessarily need to span the entire set of possible outputs, but every, it needs to be defined on, sort of uniquely defined on every input element. Um, but if I have a function from A to B plus false, um, it is possible for the, for some input value x for f of x to equal false. And I'm interpreting that as saying that the, the program didn't halt or something. There's, there's no value returned. Um, so if we forget about false, what that means is that I have a function that is defined on some subset of the inputs. So on, on certain inputs, I do get a real output, but on certain other inputs, I get false. I get sort of nothing. Okay. So again, the programs have this natural interpretation as partial functions. That's, that's generally how this goes. Programs are functions, but we can think of these particular functions as some other more complicated function or something. Yes? Well, uh, sorry, that's, um, no, no. <laughs> okay, so this, this function here is, is a like real honest to goodness function. So it, its inputs are all of A, and uh, its outputs are in this set B plus false. So real, real function. Um, however, if I'm thinking about it as some sort of arrow from A to B, because I, for some reason I wanna keep A as my inputs and B as my outputs, the interpretation in that context is as a partial function. <laughs> no, well, so, so I mean, what a function like this really is, so there, there are the, the data of this, so again, this is a real function here, this, this thing, real honest to goodness function, but I can describe it to you in a different way. Um, as something that is not a function from A to B, but a partial function from A to B. So an, another way to specify the data of a function like this is to give you firstly a subset of A, the real inputs, and then an actual function from that subset to B. Yeah, I'm sure you know many examples of partial computations, so, um, okay. But I mean, this, this is, sometimes it's useful to think of a partial function from A to B as some sort of arrow from A to B, and that's what this device that I, this category of programs device is allowing you to do. Again, what it really is is a function from A to B plus false, but I can interpret that data as a partially defined function on A, where the real inputs are all of the elements that this function maps into B and not to false. Yeah. Is partial function a concept that is just a category theory without thinking about computation? Yeah, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Um, we would describe this in a, well, yeah, I mean, absolutely, okay. so, yes. Can we also look at it from the standpoint where if you have the A, um, the A to B to B, or in a sense the A to B, uh, T to B, or T to B, right, in the first part of the region? T of B here is this B it's plus where false. We begin here. Yeah. And so that is in a sense a complete, and this in a sense is partial, so therefore we don't have the choice of. Uh, <laughs> in a sense it's not a complete. Yeah, when, so whenever I draw an ordinary arrow, right. what I mean is like a real function. Right, but in a sense it, it, this, is a, this is the monad special function that, you know, does yeah, yeah. special stuff. Yeah. Because this never completes, um, in a sense it's just a regular function. Sure. Uh, so yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let, me, let me try to keep going. So, so uh, right, so the unit in this context, again, the unit arrow in this category of programs needs to be an actual function from A to A plus false, and it's just the natural inclusion of A as the elements of A. Uh, then what is the composition operation? Well, so firstly, I need this, this mechanism for extending a function to a function like this. Um, so I'm gonna define G star to be the same as G on all of the elements of B, but I'll, it, we have a new element, false, and I'll say it sends it to false. And then you can just check 
So I'll leave this as an exercise for afterwards, that if you compose these functions, what you get is if I had a partial function from A to B and a partial function from B to C, there's sort of a unique largest partial function from A to C, and it's this. It's this thing for sure. So the category of partially defined computations from the formalism I introduced on the previous slide returns this particular category. And let me talk you through the same thing with list as well. So, so here, what I mean by a program is a function from A to finite lists in B. I mentioned already what the unit, the identity arrow is. It's this function that is a singleton, sends elements of A to singleton lists. And uh, this extension operation takes a function from B to lists in C and extends it to a function from list to list by applying G to every element in the list. Um, and then concatenating the result. A list of lists can be thought of as a list. That's the secretly the monad multiplication. And the Claisley composite is the thing that you guys would write down if you were trying to write something down. So um, let's not look at that diagram. I don't think that's helpful. <laughs> cool. OK. So that's kind of what monads do in the context of programming, maybe. <laughs> what did you mean by using the argument instead of the um, so if I had a partially defined function from A to B and a partially defined function from B to C, um, I want a function that returns a value as often as possible. That's what I meant by largest. Yes? Uh, so when you define the extension operation, is that something that's determined for each point T? Or is it something that's So the, when, when T is representing a full monad and not just a, a, a map on from sets to sets, uh, it will specify the extension operation for you um, in a particular way. And there may, so, right. So the structure of a monad includes a specified extension operation. That's, yeah, that's, that's part of the data. Okay, so now I want to try and tell you that this category of T programs that we've just defined secretly is a Levere theory, or more properly, a subcategory of it is a Levere theory. So this is the new, or maybe less familiar definition. And what is a Levere theory? Really, it's a category that presents operations and equations for some thing, some <laughs> algebraic notion. OK, so this is the bit that's going to get a little, uh, it's probably harder to understand on the first read, and I, that's OK. So just, just don't stress if it doesn't make any sense. Um, OK, so I need, I need notation for a set with n elements, and I'll write underscore n for this. OK, and let's think about this category of list programs. So when I write a squiggly arrow in the category of list programs, uh, what I mean is a function from the input set to lists in the output set. So when I write this squiggly arrow, what I mean is a function from one to list. Uh, well, and what is that? So one is the set with a single element. So to define a function with that as the inputs, I just need to tell you the image of that particular element, i.e., a list uh, whose elements, who, whose letters are one of these n elements. Okay, so what I'm arguing for you is that a, an arrow in this category of list programs from one to six, say, is a list, a finite list, so it can be whatever length, in this case length four, of elements of the set six. So a list of six elements, so it's a thing like that. Okay, so the idea in a Levere theory is that arrows of this form define n airy operations, so six airy operations. This is, uh, this is in a PhD thesis of a category theorist, Bill Levere, and it was like uh, blew everyone's mind. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Uh, oh, sorry, I need to tell you one more, even more complicated thing, and then I'll try and explain what I mean by this. So. Uh, we also, from the category of list programs, we also get equations between operations. So I've just argued for you that whenever I have a squiggly arrow from one to n, I'm gonna start calling that an operation, an n airy operation. And here I have an m airy operation. And let's suppose I had some composition relation in the category of programs. Um, I'm gonna say that's some sort of relation between the operations. So for instance, in the category of list programs, uh, one two-element list is just x1, x2. Uh, another one three-element list is x1, x2, x3. Uh, 
a function from two to three in this category. This has two elements, is a function that takes, sends the two elements to two different lists drawn from the three elements here. So for instance, I could take the singleton list containing just x1 or the list x2, x3. And uh, these morphisms do compose in the Claisley category. Um, and I, uh, the composite this way around, I guess, takes this list and that list and concatenates them. So I've, I've drawn parentheses in here to represent the concatenation operation. And this is just that. So this is some sort of relation like this. So th these, this is just meant to be sort of suggestive notation. Okay, so uh, the sort of algebraic theory associated to the category of programs has operations, which are programs from one to some finite set, and has equations that arise in this way. That's kind of the high level idea for Levier theories. Okay, so I'm calling things like operations and equations. Let's maybe see what that means on the semantic side. So by a model, and so I'm using, uh, I'm using the categorical terminology in case you wanna look this up later. I will have used the words that you'll find in the literature. Um, I'm not saying these words necessarily make a lot of sense, but these are the words that people use. So a model for the theory that I've just described uh, is comprised of a set. Uh, the th uh, so, I mean, you usually put a lot of adjectives in front of it. So this is sort of a single sorted elementary algebraic theory. Uh, I'm defining it for you. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, that's right, yes, right. So theory can be used in many different ways, but there is a precise referent here, and I'll, I think I have it in bold at some point, or in purple at some point, and I'll look at you when that appears. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, so uh, what is a model? So I, I, I right, a model. Um, so again, I, I'm arguing that whenever I draw a, a squiggly symbol like this, I'm gonna call that an n-ary operation. And if I'm uh, modeling that operation, that should be a function from this a to the n means a times a times a n times. So elements are n tuples of elements in a. So the n area means I have n, in, I need n inputs to define an output. Uh, satisfying the equations determined by the compositions in the category of programs. Okay, so let's sort of think of an example. So um, here's a list of two elements, or whose terms are drawn from two elements. It also is a list of two elements that was maybe unfortunate. Uh, here's a list of three elements whose terms are drawn from three elements. So if I'm thinking of this as an operation and this as an operation, in a model, I'm, I'm just using lambda notation, but a, a model would then give you a specified function from two inputs of A, two elements of A to one element of A, and here from three elements of A to one element of A. So each of these operations corresponds to a function of that nature. And then because I had this relationship in this category of programs in the Claisley category, um, in the model there will be some sort of corresponding function here from three inputs to two outputs. And uh, these are functions these should not be squiggly arrows. I'm, I'm making a mistake there. Uh, so I should apologize. These should be normal arrows. I'll fix that later. Um, the composite of these functions is some function, and the relation is that those two functions are the same. So whatever composition equality hold it here, held here needs to hold in the model as well. Okay. Right, so to define a model, I'm defining a set and then a load of function, you know, a function for every operation. And you have complete freedom to define the functions however you want, provided uh, they satisfy the relations that are enumerated. Okay, so that's kind of, um, right, so the, the data, I don't know if you need to understand that. Oh, so this is like, this is how I would say it in category theory, whatever, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Levier theories versus monads. So um, now, this, this last section of the talk is kind of just the high level overview. This is the bit that's gonna make less sense, um, but um, this, these are sort of big picture things that might sound intriguing, and the references at the end will be where you can actually learn the details. So, so Levier theories are a thing, monads are a thing, yes? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so these are sort of codes for arities of functions and relationships between functions, and then these, on the model side, you need to specify an actual set of inputs and actual functions satisfying them. It could be, I mean, so as you're, relative to the set, you'll define the function in whatever way you want. There's a lot of freedom here. So I've, I've used some sort of notation, but it, it could be whatever, yeah. Uh, I'll hang, hold that question, I'm gonna get there, uh, actually. Secretly, yes. <laughs> but presented in a totally different way. So that's, yeah, there's a theorem, just a second. Okay, so T again is like list, some sort of notion of computation. Um, so by L of T, this is different from the KL of T before. This is the category of T programs, but I'm restricting the objects, so just, uh, the finite sets that I was talking about before. I have one one element set, one two element set, one n element set, secretly one zero element set. Okay, so the, if I, opposite category just means formally turn around the arrows, that's still a category, um, and that's what a Levere theory is, or an example of a Levere theory. So Levere theory is some complicated definition that I'm avoiding telling you, um, but how do you find one? You look at the category of programs, you restrict to the finite sets, you turn around the arrows. Done. Okay, <laughs> and uh, a model, I, so I'm secretly, if you know what a functor is, there's this very slick definition of a model. It's just a contravariant functor from L of T into sets or whatever category, WCPO, any category you have in mind. Models can exist in any category with finite products. And um, secretly, this functor needs to preserve products. So on objects, it must send the one element set to A, to some object A, and then all of these other um, maps are determined. The two element set then needs to go to A times A, the N element set to A to the N. Um, and by saying it's a contravariant functor, it says whenever I have an arrow from N to M in the category of programs, I get a function from AM to AN. So that's really what a model is. There's a very slick categorical definition. So you might have encountered a related idea of algebras for a monad, as opposed to models for Levere theory. Um, Here's the definition, doesn't matter what that means, but it's a, it's a set with some function from T of A to A satisfying a unit and associativity condition, and these are the same notion. They're presented completely differently, so this is definitely a theorem. Um, so models are this, to each model, uh, there's an associated algebra, to each algebra there's an associated model, moreover the homomorphisms between them also agree. These categories are equivalent over set if you want. So. So this is a different way for thinking about the same thing. The whole point of this talk is this is a different way for thinking about the same thing. <laughs> okay, so let me now say something about the comparison of monads versus Levere theories. So a monad, remember, some sort of notion of computation, some sort of large function from set to set, so that the T programs, functions like this, define the arrows in some category, the Cleisley category for the monad, uh, if I sort of cut down to T programs between finite sets and then formally turn around the arrows, that's a Levere theory. And conversely, if I started from a Levere theory, I didn't tell you what a Levere theory is. Um, if you look up the definition, you'll see why I didn't tell you. But uh, <laughs> if you had one of those, uh, then um, you would get a monad on sets. And moreover, Levere theories are equivalent to monads. So it's an it's equivalent way to present universal algebra, or sorry, monads on set. Here I actually do mean the category of sets. We can talk about that later if you want to know that. Um, there's a slight lie. Uh, so it's, it's monads with a particular adjective, uh, finitary monads. Um, a finitary monad is something that preserves finiteness somehow, or there's a technical way to say that that I'm trying to avoid saying. But um, most of the monads you've encountered are finitary, and so they correspond to Levere theories in this one-to-one -one way. I'll tell you the one that is not in a second. Okay, so why, so I've, I've just given this whole talk about Levere theories and then at the end concluded they're the same as monads, so why bother? Um, so here's some uh, advantages of Levere theories. So uh, monads are presented really as something, an endofunctor of one category, something that acts on just one category, and it's if you have a monad on one category and you want a monad on a totally different category, that's not always obvious how to transport them, um, whereas the models of a Levere theory, um, can be defined in any category sort of immediately. The, the real definition is in any category. So that's 
an advantage. Um, and there's some sort of functoriality if I'm changing the location of the models, the category of the models or the input category, um, there's some sort of functoriality there. Um, Lavier theories are also good, for, can be combined uh, in a natural way. So if I want to add operations from an L to operations from an L prime, there's an easy way to do that. Um, in fact, they're much more, so locally finitely presentable means you can form all limits and co-limits you, you want, so there, you can do very complicated combinations of operations. Um, there's also some sort of intertwining. So if I want the operations from L to commute with the operations from L prime, there's this thing called the tensor product of Lavier theories that allows you to do that. Um, and this is the bit that you're gonna have to look up in the references at the end, but uh, in practice, um, specifying a monad can be somewhat complicated and Lavier theories uh, are often freely generated by a very small collection of operations and equations between them. So some examples of monads that look particularly nice from the Lavier theory perspective, and you can read about them in the references I'll list in just a second, are exceptions or side effects or interactive input output. These, um, these work very well on this side. Okay, so the one monad that does not fit in this framework is continuations. Um, and this is the th because it's not finiteary as a monad. Um, so finiteary is something to do with size. Continuations is involving a power set, and power sets are, there's uh, this Cantor's paradox that says it blows up sizes, and so that's kind of the secret reasons. Um, so there is an expanded notion of large Lavier theory. I'm using large in the same sense as I was previously, and it is one of those, but the, the good properties that I just enumerated, uh, if they exist on large Lavieries, it's sort of for arbitrary, surprising reasons. So, um, so I, I'm quoting now from a paper, it appears that continuations monad transformer should be seen as something sui generis. So sort of anything that's true for continuations um, is kind of surprising, I guess, uh, from, the, from the mathematical perspective, because it's a, it is, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> right. Um, whereas uh, for the other Lavier theories, so for side effects, in, in exceptions, input, output, lists, non-determinism, the probability monad that's gonna appear later, um, I would expect the same constructions to be available for all of those because they're all Lavier theories in the ordinary sense. Okay, so uh, this talk was inspired, as I mentioned, by a paper, Category Theoretic Understanding of Universal Algebra, Lavier Theories and Monads from Highland and Power. Um, and uh, so particularly when I'm thinking about these monads for computational effects as Lavier theories, uh, they fit into this framework that a mathematician would call universal algebra. So this is a sort of branch of universal algebra. And from this particular viewpoint, uh, they argue, so I'm, I'm quoting from the paper, that continuations are just a very different sort of computational effect. So had uh, the history of um, the develop this sort of category theory in computer science focused more on Lavier theories than monads, which after all are the same. Um, the perspective might be that continuations are not a computational effect, but rather a distinct notion that has its theory, and you'd still study the relationship between it and computational effects, but it's perhaps uh, regarded as a separate thing. Um, and I don't really know uh, what to make of this last sentence, but uh, so Martin Highland was one of the first people who taught me category theory and he's very profound, so I thought I would just uh, write that up for you. <laughs> okay, so what are, what's a takeaway? So this, if, Lavier theories are kind of, yes, sorry. Uh, so it's not the only example of a non finiteary monad, so I know Another one, um, it's the ultra filter monad. Um, if you know what that are, uh, algebras for that are compact Hausdorff spaces, which is like kind of crazy. It's some sort of thing from topology that arises from ultra filters somehow. Um, and I don't know anything myself about the relationship between continuations and ultra filters. I'm sure somebody does. Um, so I don't know how to answer your, your question. But it does seem to be prototypical of non finiteary monads. Okay, let me try and leave you with something if the, the last bit didn't make a lot of sense. So uh, let T be some 
sort of computational effect. Uh, so we can think of a program relative to T as some sort of function whose inputs are of type A and whose outputs are of type T of B. So finite subsets of B or something like this. Uh, the point of enhancing the data of T to a monad is to be able to turn these programs into a category, so to be able to compose programs with no restrictions. Um, but the category that you see in this way, the category that you meet in this way, is something that I would recognize as a Levere theory, which is some sort of uh, categorical expression of universal algebra. It has operations of various arities and equations between them. And uh, I guess that's what I just said. And it's uh, on the other side, if you started with just this category of operations and equations, you could recover the monad T. Assuming the monad was finite here, it'll be the same one that you started with. Um, and this perspective might uh, be clarifying in certain applications. So if you want to read more about that, uh, this, is the, uh, this is where I got all my language about programming. I mean, this is sort of the original uh, paper that describes more precisely um, this Claisley category construction and that how to recover a monad from the Claisley triple. Um, so this is a, in some sense, a survey paper of some other, so summarizing some other work of Plotkin and Power. Plotkin was Mogi's thesis advisor um, and describes very well the connection between monads and Levere theory. So there's there's something some subtlety that I've slept under the rug. So the, the monads you guys meet um, are often what we would call strong monads. So there's, there's an additional strength operation um, that corresponds to some sort of enriched Levere theories. And that connection is described in this paper. So if you want to really dig in to the details. Um, and this is sort of more philosophical. It's, uh, the, it um, describes uh, the examples that I've mentioned, mentioned and how they're generated by particular morphisms or particular arrows um, as Levere theories, um, but it's maybe written a little more for category theorists, so you can read the introduction and the conclusion and probably skip the middle. <laughs> so, all right, uh, thanks very much. No.